What's up, everyone? This is Jeremy Gunslinger. Now, okay, now this has been an on and off project for me for a little while since I got the gun. Now, I'm wanting to tell you about the reproduction, then tell you a little historical facts that I know of during the Civil War. I have tried to find some from outside the Civil War. Uh, I don't know. There's not a lot of, I guess, either it's just disappeared wasn't wrote down, mislabeled, uh, I don't know, uh, but I'm gonna tell you what I think might have happened is that after the war ended, or probably during the war, it just went home with somebody as their personal weapon, uh, war souvenirs, which were allowed to be took by a lot of armies at that time, and stuff like that probably just went out west I don't know and alright anyway let's start out the reproduction what I like and what I don't like and you know alright barrel length is seven and a half inches average velocity with 15 grains of powder now uh, you're gonna get big for average with a round ball Blech. I just tongue tied all that up. Try that again. Average velocity with 15 grains with a 375 round ball. You're going to get between three, uh, three, five, 585 and 680. 668. Blah. I cannot talk today. Feet per second. Now that depends on powder. Uh, and that's from. Uh, Guns of the Old West, and that's also from Hodgson's Basic Muzzleloader Manual. This is the, uh, I think last year's, uh, 36 caliber Navy, might as well say, triple seven, I'm, uh, 15 grains on gets 662, according to them at 15 grains. Uh, and then Dustin Weinerker went out and tested it at, on his Navy with triple seven at the, then got six, six, eight, well, with some Go X2, and now this is all 3F, I've got 2F, so it's going to be a little bit short, smaller, but I got the 2F so I can reload 38 special semi watch cutters after I get everything else, but anyway, uh, he got about as an average 585 five. so that's where I got the two numbers you know I use what he had because it's what he, where he is once I get a chronograph I will test all that stuff out to see what I get here because one different elevations weather conditions uh, where he was shooting at it looked kind of very sandy and dry uh, where I'm at it's a lot of moisture in the air because I'm in the south and farm country of the south, the Delta part. So it could be a little different. It could be a little faster. It could be a little slower. Because all that does affect. But anyway. Now this thing, fully loaded, weighs about a pound, pound and a half. That's a very light revolver. I mean, I'm thinking about taking this out for when I go just... Just out. Just want to go out in the woods and have something. I mean, give me five shots. Uh, round ball or that Lee, you know, black powder cartridge. I mean, you just take. It would take care of a snake. It would take care of if it's rabbit season, squirrel season. I see one. I just. Get one and be plenty powerful enough for that because it meets the, according to my state law, it meets the qualifications for that and it, you know, it's for small game. So, I mean, I gotta make sure I'm gonna double, double check and, you know. But the modern reproductions do a very, very good job. I mean, except for the grips, but of course, when by the time we actually took pictures of it, we don't know what kind of grips they would have. Uh, cause you know, they're wore down and everything, but 
I do not like this reddish. I am probably going to get take this off, you know, strip it and redo it myself because I don't like that. But I won't leave this as well. I'm doing a bunch of videos until I do show you what I do because I have not even customized the sight at all, which is one on the hammer right there, and then that brass that thing. I, I, you know, I'm probably going to turn this into a black powder pistol shoot competition, you know, because which I can only use round ball. And I, you know, find a good load for that. Uh, okay, now the thing is, the original should have a cylinder that looks very similar to this Remington. But in just 30, you know, if I had a 36 Remington in it, I'd show you that. But this is my 44 Remington. Captain Ball, as you can see. Should have a very plain, plain side. Not really, I mean, that that's what this should look like on this gun. You know, something like, well, something kind of like that. That's how that should look. But I have a feeling for cost effectiveness and everything. I hope that didn't. I have cats. They use a Colt Navy cylinder. And yes, this is loaded because I was going to go shooting today. And so I loaded up a few guns and yeah. It started raining, so that's out of the picture. I'm not going to go... I'm not going to get sick just to, you know, shoot, burn some powder. And I have a, like I said, I have a feeling they did that just because they probably use a lot of Navy stuff on this because this looks like a Navy loading lever. Okay. Uh, this looks like a Navy front except just rounded down. So, I mean, they could probably just bank in Navy and says, oh, we, we need... Uh, they make X and they have some extra, which working as a fashion worker, you have, you know, sometimes you make too many. They might take some of these, those extras that, you know, are good. You know, they quality, you know, they have to go, all guns have to go through quality control. And they might just take some, make Leech and Rigdon. Wouldn't say that, you know, let's say Midway or just two, uh, 200 Leech and Rigdon, just 200 navies. You know, someone makes 235. The Leech and Rigdon shorts, short 30. I just take some navies, smack them, you know, give them the, you know, make them look like a Leech and, Leech and Rigdon. There they, and then out the door. Which, I mean, it wouldn't be hard. And by the way, uh, because of the weird ass weather, my normal treatment to these things is not working. For long-term storage, uh, there's a little rust right there. I have to take these apart. So I had something that would help with this, that, but it's just been hot, rainy, hot, rainy, hot, rainy, high, rainy. It, it, it's just been very moist. So, but anyway, <clears throat> so like I said, that just probably to help keep costs down. Now, a lot of this comes from Leached and Rigdon, revisited by Kent Wall. You can go. He talks about a lot more. He talks about the Leech, Thomas Leech by himself, then Leeched and Rigdon, which this is what it's named as. Okay? This is just what this one's called Leeched and Rigdon. That's why I'm doing the Leeched and Rigdon, not Ashley and Rigdon. That's a different one. Which I could literally use the same gun for all three. But anyway, I'm not going through all that. But anyway, it had a rounded, according, even historically, it had a round barrel with six shot, 36 caliber, and it had an iron frame. Now, modern reproductions use probably mild steel, you know, probably the cheapest steel they can buy. That will still do the, you know, handle the pressures. Uh, just under 2,400 based on records of surviving serial number guns uh, are left, and roughly 3,600 ish were made, but not all. Uh, now, that could be the complete thing that now, whether those were all shipped out, what happened to them, I don't know. So, I mean, it's like, 
that's according to his books, like 3,000 and something were made, but only 2,400 are surviving. So, I mean, that's a pretty good survivability. So, the fact that, now here's the thing, Time Life said these were made out of dubious metals and they would explode if you shot them today. Yeah, if you throw modern gunpowder in it. If I was to throw Stephen Trail Boss in here and pull the trigger and it went off, it'd go boom. But anyway, uh, Cylinder was playing. We already got over that, you know, through that. Uh, now, this started roughly around, you know, the Leech Den Rigging actually started around the spring of 1862. And, you know, then became the Leech Den Agni. So it continued into the near the end of the war. So, I mean, it was around for almost all the war. I mean, it's, it was around for a while. So there was a lot of these in Confederate cavalrymen, officers. It was the second, second most produced cap and ball revolver during the Civil War for the Confederate. Sorry, I did. Sorry. Hiccups. I'm back now. It's for the Confederate. It was the second most produced Confederate revolver. And I mean, how light it is. I mean, and believe it or not, you would think it'd be kind of front heavy because of how no it bounce when you have the cylinder in it balances nicely and it is I mean almost identical to a Colt so I mean if Colt made dubious why would they you know copy it I mean the only one that was more popular was the Griswold and Gunnison which was uh brass basically if I'm not mistaken, you know, it's just a brass frame. I mean, you can buy those now. Uh, it was like a brass frame Remington style with some, you know, with some alterations. That just when I get one, I'll do, you know, more of it. You know, there's a lot more on that one. That's probably one. it's either that or the Walker, which depends on when my tax come back in. Cause yeah, depends on when I hear my taxes. <laughs> Y'all might already know what my next gun is, but anyway. Uh, this should, uh, hopefully soon I will be out to the range and do some testing. I have uh, some 50 cal 777 testing. I have my CVA Bobcat, my Knight. Eh, I was, I'm going to get me another... Like I said, I'm going to get me another either 50 cal rifle or a walker or something. I might even get one of those ready kits and see how well they are. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, eh. But anyway, guys, I hope you've enjoyed. If you have, hit the like button. See you later.